I'm honored to be here. I'm excited. It is a privilege to be able to sit in this worship center and be able to stand in this pulpit. I just want to honor your pastor and his dad and his family and all of you guys. Thank you for having me. It's, it's an exciting time, I believe, in the kingdom of God. I believe it's an exciting time in the world. If we look at where the world is today compared to what was 50 years ago, it looks far, far worse now than it was then. Would you agree with that? Things seem to be getting crazier and crazier. People are going further and further away from God. And I'm excited about it. Why am I excited about it? Because that means there's more opportunity to win more and more to Jesus. That's what I believe we've been put on this earth for. I believe each and every one of us have been created on purpose and for a purpose. And that purpose is the greater purpose in our lives or to make a difference in other people's lives. And I am excited about that opportunity that is before us today. And every day that we wake up and we live this life of faith, we have an opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives. For me, there was many that made a difference in my life. They didn't see it. They, they didn't think even some of them a minute later, they never thought I would really ever surrender my heart to Jesus, but so many people tried. As Pastor mentioned, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up around Christianity. My mother's a full-blood Italian. My father's a full-blood Irishman. I grew up a very staunch, non-practicing Catholic. You know what a non-practicing Catholic is? Somebody don't never go to church. The only time I did go to church was like a funeral or Easter or Christmas or somewhere around there. And then when I went, I didn't get it. I'll just be real truthful with you. I didn't understand it. My dad had left when I was one. My mom was married five times. I grew up in the heart of a ghetto. I was smoking dope, drinking beer, chewing tobacco, washing my own clothes, and, eat, and finding and cooking my own food by the time I was eight years old. I'd watch my sister get brutalized over and over again by my mom's boyfriends. And I, I mean, it's just the, the abuse was through the roof, physical, emotional, everything you could think of. I've had cigarettes put out on my face just as a biker wanted to show me how a match or a cigarette could burn twice. So I grew up in what I would consider hell on earth. And I didn't understand. I believed that there was a God out there, but I didn't understand how in the world we could close the gap between he and I. And then I'd go to church in the, in the Catholic church, and I would just get more and more confused. I would see this dude hanging on a cross, had no idea why. I would see this guy wearing a very fancy robe, carrying some very expensive equipment down the aisle, humming some hums and hymning some hymns, and I would think I could take all of that to the pawn shop and feed my family for like two weeks right now. They would speak in Latin. I didn't understand Latin. And I just, I got more confused. And then my mother, she went on this spiritual journey. She went on this crazy journey. She was, she was brutalized growing up. She had a terrible upbringing. And she was so empty on the inside. And she was looking for answers. And so she started to go on this journey. And as she was going on her journey, she was looking for faith. She was looking for an answer. So she went all over the place. We went from the Catholic non-practicing type straight into an inner city black Baptist church. Now, I don't know about y'all if y'all never seen one, but it was awesome. It was so much better. I didn't have a clue still what the heck was going on. But I knew this was a lot better than what I would saw. And then we went on to the next one. And then the next one. And then the Lutheran church. Then even some cults. Because she didn't know. She was just looking. And all along the way, I remember as a young boy, I kept getting more and more confused. Because I thought like this, all these people say they believe in the same God. But yet, they present God to me in such a completely different way every time I go to church. These guys present him as somebody I can never reach. These ones present him as somebody that's mean and looking to punish me. These guys present him as somebody who's just so loose that he doesn't care what I do. He just loves me no matter. Are you, are you with me? Like, in the end, I, I looked around and I thought, this, is, this makes no sense. And so I felt like church was fake. 
And I felt like church was, was people, was man's way to try to manipulate people. So I began to hate church. Couldn't stand it. Didn't want to be anywhere around it. But then God began to speak to my heart as an unsaved teenager, far away from God. He began to speak to my heart. I remember I had won the biggest game of the season in football, and I'd scored the winning touchdown with seconds to go on the clock, and everybody's celebrating in the end zone, and, and I'm looking up in the stands, and I don't have one friend or family member there. They're like Ricky Bobby, leaving the tickets for his dad. Y'all ever see Talladega Nights? If you didn't, you need to. And I was just waiting, and I remember my heart became so sad, and I couldn't figure out why Am I so good at these things and no one cares? And then I heard the audible voice of God for the first time in my life. And God spoke to me. I care. I've been at every practice. I've been at every game. I've been there at the worst times. I've been there at the best times. And I'll always be here for you. And I remember it like yesterday. I get tears in my eyes thinking about it. And at that moment, I didn't know what the heck. I thought I thought somewhat I was a bit crazy. Everybody's jumping on me, celebrating. I'm like punching my teammates to get them off me because I'm trying to figure out who is that and where is that coming from. And then it went on for about three to six months. I just kept feeling this, this oppression. I would now know what to describe it, but I didn't know what it was back then. I just felt this weight, this filthiness, this, this, this guilt, this shame, all of this pain coming upon me to the point where I felt like I couldn't carry on. As a 15-year-old boy, I laid in my bed with a shotgun loaded to my chin, and I cried out, God, if you're really there, If that was you who spoke to me on that football field that day, I need you. You said you would never leave me. I didn't know the Bible, but he was quoting scripture. Later when I would read the Bible at 23 years old, I would see, oh my God, this is what he spoke and and this is what he spoke. But I said, God, I need you. I'm desperate. I don't want to live anymore. If this is what life is about, I don't want life. And then like a a Polaroid, I don't know if any of y'all remember what a Polaroid camera is, you know? One of those, like a Polaroid flash bulb, it went off of my ceiling, and I saw this picture. I saw this picture of this beautiful, brunette, auburnish, colored hair, blue eyes, thin, tall, wonderful girl. And I saw next to her, she was holding the hand of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl. And on the other side was this big, hulking looking of a man, very sharp, abs of steel, holding, looked like one of those little cutouts you do, you know? I never in my life have I ever seen happiness in a family, but I saw this picture, and I saw pure happiness, and God said, this is your family, this is your future, you wanted one reason to live? I've given it to you. I put that gun down. I've never thought about it ever since. Hear this now. I then got in a fight, as usual, at school, got kicked out. And then I used my dad's address without him knowing about it. And I went to a school district that his house was located in. I walk into English class first day. And when I walk into English class first day, there sits that girl. I knew it as soon as I saw her. I literally, I can remember it like yesterday. I I felt a numbness come over my whole body. I I felt I didn't know what to do. I I sat right behind her, and I tapped her on her shoulder. The only difference was, was in in the picture God showed me, she had this, like, brunette colored hair. And in real life, she had like this, I'm talking about Prince Purple Rain, hardcore, bright purple hair. Now, what I didn't know was that she tried to dye it really bright red, didn't like it, tried to dye it black, didn't like it, tried to go back to red, and poof, it turned out purple. And this is day one of school, so it's a little bit sensitive to her because she's, she's got purple hair. I ain't never seen no chick with purple hair. So I, I, I tapped her on her shoulder. She turned around. She said, what? And I said, hey, what's up with the purple hair? And she turned around and gave me about... Ten, three, and four-letter words and told me to 
go somewhere really hot at the end of all that. And the guy next to me said, man, you don't want to mess with her. She's a fireball. I said, oh, that's exactly who I want to mess with. And I tapped back on her shoulder again, and she turned around. She said, what? What do you want? I said, I just want you to know one thing, girl. She said, what is it? And I said, I'm going to marry you one day. And she said, are you crazy? I said, yeah, I am, but that ain't got nothing to do with what I'm telling you. I'm going to marry you one day. I pursued her. That was our sophomore year. I pursued her for two years, finally got her to date me. January 2000 and, or 2000, 1991. And we, I wish it was do that, right? Shave off 10 years of my life. And we've been together ever since. We had one child, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God is always with you. He told David, if you make your bed in hell, I'll lie there with you. If you ascend to the highest mountain, I will ascend with you. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? He says this. Jesus said, even when you are unfaithful, I am still faithful, for I cannot deny myself. So I, I proposed to Melissa... We dated through our senior year, and then I got in some more trouble. I'm just going to tell you the short story. I knocked out my high school principal, really dumb thing to do, and then I went to jail. I was 18 years old, and I was facing up to seven years in a state prison for what I did. And I was scared out of my mind. I wanted to, I had scholarship offers for college, and I was trying to use those scholarships to get an education and then go into the Marine Corps as an officer, as my dad was a highly decorated Marine during Vietnam. That was my plan. My plan got all blown up as soon as I acted like an idiot and put my hands on a state official. Now, I'm laying on a steel bed, having some big, grown men tell me what they're going to do to me once they let me out of that cell. I was like, oh, God. Like, if you're really out there still, like, I know I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I promise you anything but that. I don't care how big and bad you are, you ain't that big and bad. I went before the judge, and the judge told me what I was facing, and then he said to me, somebody else brought forth another option, but I doubt that you'll take it. So I've told them, don't worry about it. I said, sir, he said, yes. I said, I, I can promise you this, I'll take anything but that. He said, you mean that? And I said, yes. He said, bailiff, open the door. In comes walking my dad, who I not saw in five years. I met him five times my entire life. In comes walking my dad with two lawyers and the entire United States Marine Corps recruiting station out of Cleveland, Ohio, in their dress blues with stacks of paperwork, and my, my solution was this, boy, you can go now in the enlisted branch or you can go back there. I was like, S -s -s sign me up. Right? Like, I I I'm in, like, oorah, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm sold out. While I'm waiting to go in to boot camp, I had to go through some, like, anger management classes and stuff during the summer, you know. And I'm waiting to go to boot camp. Melissa and I were driving home one night, doing stupid stuff as kids shouldn't do, and we're driving, and now for the third time, I hear God audibly speak to me. And he says, this is the girl you plan to spend the rest of your life with. And I said, yes. He said, then why are you leading her to hell instead of leading her to me? Now, this time, I'd been in a full gospel Bible preaching church at least a few times, and I heard for the first time back then when I was 16 why Jesus actually went on the cross. So I knew the truth now. I knew the, I knew the nuts and bolts. I kind of knew Genesis, Gospel, Revelation, and about a two-minute spill. So I had to pull the, the car over in a parking lot in a grocery store, and I laid at night, and I said, Melissa, do you believe in God? She looked at me and said, why are you asking me? I said, because I think I'm supposed to. And she said, yeah, I, I, I guess I believe in God. I said, what do you believe? And she said, well, if you're, if you're good, you go to heaven. You're bad, you go to hell. I said, do you know who Jesus is? And she said, it's so cute. She said, yeah, isn't he that little baby in the manger? This is, what, this is the world I come from. So far lost, so far gone, people don't even know who he really is. We take things for granted thinking it's America. 
Everybody knows who Jesus is. This is a girl back in 1991 who didn't know who Jesus was. And I said, yeah, he, he is that cute little baby. But, you know, he kind of grew up, went on to do some pretty awesome things. And I told her about that. She got so angry at me. You mean to tell me that, that my family and me, my dad, my mom, my sister, my brother, yeah, they, they're all, everybody's going to hell without you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're saying a little bit more abrupt than I told you, but, yeah, pretty much. Everybody's, everybody's going. And she said back to me, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm done. I'm done talking. I just want to go home. And so the next day she demanded a meeting. I thought it's over. She's coming to break up with me. She came into my house with tears pouring down her face. She said, I went home last night. I thought about every word you said. I put my knees on the side of the bed, and I cried out to Jesus. And Chris, he came in to my heart. And I was like, "Woo, that's awesome. And she said, you told me not to look at your life as an example but I'm telling you today, I want you to look at my life as an example from this day forward. I will live my life for him every single day from here on out. And I can tell you, she's the greatest Christian I know. And she told me, there's no more drinking, there's no more partying, there's no more this, there's no more that. And I was like, whoa, girl, slow down. Got a Jesus freak on my hands already. But she was dead serious. She was dead serious. I go to boot camp. I come home. I marry her. A little while longer we have Candace. And now we're living our life. The problem is that she's living her life for Jesus. And the Marine Corps done unlocked something to me that wasn't real good. I was a great Marine, but I was a terrible person. I became even meaner than I was, even hard, more hard-hearted than I was. I, I became more violent than I already was. It just it fueled that, that anger and that emptiness. That was a, I was a great Marine. I just sucked at everything else. Can I say that in church? Is that right? I, I say that at Reach Church, but i got to tone it down sometimes when I travel around. You know what I mean? But I got in this position, and now my wife, I'm telling her, you deserve somebody so much better than me. You should go. You should leave. Take Candace, find a good Christian man, live your life the way you should. And she would look at me every time with tears in her eyes, and she would say, I'm never giving up on you, and I'm never giving up on the call that God has on your life. One day, Chris, you will do great things for God. And I'd be like, oh, shut up, I don't want to hear that stuff, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward to when I was 23 years old. Candace is now five. We are in North Carolina. Melissa's at work. Candace wants to go out and play some basketball. We lived in a cul-de-sac on base right next to the woods. And I said, go ahead, honey, go ahead out. I'll put my shoes on and I'll meet you out there. Within two minutes of her being out there alone. I hear this blood-curdling scream. She comes running around the house. I'm flying out of the back of the house. I meet her halfway, and she jumps into my arms, and she's screaming, Daddy, Daddy, my foot, my foot, my foot. I look down. I said, what happened, honey? What's going on? She said, something hit my foot. Something hit my foot. It burned so bad, Dad. It burned so bad. And I take her into the house. I take her shoe off, take her sock off, and there's two triangular puncture marks about three centimeters apart. With a fluid-like substance leaking out of it. Now, the Marine Corps manual says verbatim, that's a snake bite. I was blinded to it. I said, baby, you probably hit your foot on like a pine cone or a piece of iron or something laying out in the woods somewhere. And she said, no, Daddy, I'm telling you, I was standing there and something hit my foot. And I'm, okay, and she's a little bit of a drama queen, you know. And so she's crying. Rah! I'm like, all right, here's some baby Tylenol, maybe a little Benadryl. You know, go to sleep. And nothing would change. For the better, it all changed for the worse. Ten minutes later, worse. Hour later, she's screaming so hard, she's losing her voice. I look at her foot, and it's already swollen. And there's a big blood blister where that bite had been. On the third day, her foot, like a, 
Looked like a balloon, blisters all over it. I don't know if you've ever seen a rattlesnake bite, but it's horrific. Her big toenail had popped off. Her skin was splitting open. And on that third day, the, the head pediatrician took me out in the hallway and he said, is your little girl afraid of helicopters? I was like, man, I don't know. She's never been in one. Why are you asking me that? He said, we have to evac her to a, the children's hospital to have an operation. I said, Doc, don't beat around the bush. Tell me what's going on. What kind of operation? And, she, and he, the doctor told me, we have to amputate. We have to amputate her foot for sure and probably most of her calf. And the longer we wait, the more amputation has to take place, and then her life becomes in danger. we got to do it now. I've already contacted your command. You're on, tur you're on medical leave right now. Go home, get your wife. Get enough stuff for about two weeks. Candace won't know she's having an amputation. She's going to wake up without a leg. There's going to be a lot of physical and psychological rehabilitation that's going to take place. And, da -da -da -da. and I'm like standing there with my life flashing before my eyes because one week before that, one of my older brothers who had gotten saved started a church in Pennsylvania started a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center, had given me a prophetic word the week before that there was a danger coming to my future and that I was resisting God like Saul was. I was kicking against the pricks. I was literally resisting the very call and purpose on my life. And because of that, I'm outside of the grace of God. And if I'm outside of the grace of God, that means I'm in the domain of the devil. And the devil's got a plan. He's setting a trap to try to destroy your life, Chris. You need to surrender your heart to God. He told me this a week before. I gave him every cuss word in the book, threatened him and his family, and left his house instantly and drove back down to North Carolina. And now here we are a week later with that word coming to pass. I come home. I tell Melissa she passes out literally like a wet noodle in front of me. I'm like, man, I don't know what to do with that. We got to go. So I propped her head up with a pillow. I got my, some of y'all remember this, I got my 1996 cordless phone. You know what I'm talking about? Like this, with the antenna up to the freaking moon. And I walked into my bathroom, and I called up my brother, and I told him, what have you done? You've cursed my family. You've spoken this on my family. He said, what's going on, Chris? I tell him. He said, listen to me. God spoke to me the word in two parts. But he told me to say the second part for when you called because you weren't going to listen to the first. I said, okay. I'm listening. And he said, Chris, I had no idea what it meant Till right now, it makes so much sense. I said, what is it? He said, it's so simple. Here's all I wrote down. When Chris calls, tell him this. I will take it away like it never happened if he surrenders his heart to me. So y'all hear that and you think, it's revival time. For me, I got more anger than I've ever been in my life. How's that possible? How could God take this away? She's being medevac to a hospital. In an hour, they're having surgery. They're taking my daughter's leg off, the one that I promised her since she was in her mama's belly that I would never let anybody hurt her, that I would never let anybody harm her. And now I feel like I am the source that's hurting her. I threw my phone against the wall. I said, I don't want to hear that stuff. Just get your church praying. Threw the phone up against the wall. I slammed my fist down on my bathroom sink. I was about 230 pounds of about 9% body fat of USDA Marine Corps muscle. I had muscles popping out of my earlobes. I kind of still do, but not quite. Not really. Not even the same ballpark, okay? But I thought I was a tough guy. I was beating on my chest like King Kong. And I screamed in the mirror, God, if you got something to say to me, why don't you man up and come say it face to face? That was a dumb idea. I went to walk out of my bathroom. I grabbed a hold of my doorknob, and it felt like a thousand volts of electricity shot through my body, and it literally cleaned me off of my feet, and I landed on my hands and my knees in my bathroom. I'd never been knocked down by nothing. And here I was, on my hands and knees. I tried to get up, 
but it felt like a ceiling had fell into, fallen down on top of me. I felt this weight. It wasn't a, a bad weight. It didn't feel harmful to me. It just felt like you ain't going nowhere. And I'm struggling against it, and, and all of a sudden I saw, uh, with my eyes, with my physical eyes, I saw this bright white light coming into the room like waves of an ocean. And they were just coming in and cascading into my soul, into my body. And with every wave that hit me, I just began to break and began to weep. I have not cried since the third grade. True story. Even when Candace was born, now I let my eyeballs sweat like a good Marine will. You know what that means, like they got teary eyes, but nothing touched my cheeks. So it don't count as a cry. And right now I'm bawling like a baby. I got that ugly cry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't talk. I can't breathe. I got snot coming out my nose, drool coming out my mouth. As I feel a peace and a warmth all over my body that I've never felt. I never knew it was possible. The scripture I would read later says that the peace of God passes all understanding. I, I didn't know that scripture then, but I can tell you, when I read it, I'm like, that's what happened to me. I couldn't get it. Like It was so far beyond my comprehension, but I knew it was real. And the next thing I know, the whole room is flooded with this light. I don't see anything but light, and it's so blinding. And then in the midst of the light, comes a figure, and as he walks towards me, he gets more clear, more clear, and then he stands in front of me, and I know it's Jesus, not the Jesus I had saw in the church pictures, not the cute little white dude with the long flowing hair and the, and the perfectly trimmed beard holding the little lamb sitting on the tree with a, maybe a twig in his mouth, maybe that's a country version, but you know what I'm talking about, he looked like a king. His eyes, they were full of fire. On top of his head were many crowns. His robe was white, but it was dipped in blood. Across his chest was written the name of his name, and it is the word of God. His feet were like bronze, and he was standing there, and when he spoke, it sounded like rushing water. It sounded like, it sounded like Niagara Falls speaking with words. I trembled and I shook. I had no idea that any of this was possible. I'm freaked out beyond imagination, but yet I still have this peace about me. And he says to me, you asked me to come and meet you face to face. And so here I am. I've got a great plan for your life. I've got a calling upon you. I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't even know what these terms meant, but I'm going to use you to plant churches. I'm going to use you to reach the lost. You will travel upon every continent. You will preach to every tongue, and you will win hundreds of thousands to me. But you have to surrender your heart. I will make Candace whole, but this now. Is up to you. And I can't give you the full version, but what I know now is he was walking me through this inner healing. I had, I had so much anger and so much bitterness, and, and I had plans. Like, I had serious plans even written out. Like, when I'm big enough and bad enough, and I was now, I'm going back and getting this one and that one and this one, and I know where that one lives, and I started finding addresses, and, and I was compiling a list of revenge. And in one moment, it was all gone. I forgave every one of them. I let it go like it never happened. I could tell you my testimony today of my upbringing like it never even happened to me because it feels like it literally never did. I was completely healed, made completely whole, washed as white as snow in one moment. And then Jesus, he reaches his hands out to me. He's picks me up off the floor, and he says, now go. Go. Candace as well, tell everybody you know what happened here today, and tell them about me. I went running out of that bathroom. My wife had already woke up, but she was like in shock, just sitting there shaking and looking around like she's goofy. She loves when I tell that part of the story on the living room floor, and I came and I ran, and I, I grabbed her by her shoulders, and I said, baby, we got to go. We got to go. She said, Ooh. Why are you crying? She's never seen me crying. She said, is she dead? Is she dead? I'm like, no, baby, she ain't dead. Everything's going to be all right. She said, what do you mean? I said, I just saw Jesus in the bathroom. 
And he said that everything's going to be all right. And she was like, you saw who? I was like, I saw Jesus. Where? I was like, oh, never mind, girl, this sounds crazy. Come on, we got to go. I get in our Jeep. We start driving up to Greenville, North Carolina. I call my brother up on my $5 a minute bag phone. You know what I'm talking about? The buttons are on the outside. Do, 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 do. I said, Jim, I ain't got a lot of time because I ain't got a lot of money. But I got to tell you what just happened. I told him everything. Him and I are weeping. I said, bro, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do now? And he said, Chris, when you don't know what to do, you got to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you. I said, you talking about that speaking in tongues stuff, bro? He said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I said, man, I ain't doing that. That stuff's weird. You know what he said to me? Chris, for once in your life, would you just shut up and listen? I was like, all right, I'm listening. He said, hang the phone up with me and pray this prayer. I hung the phone up. Melissa had not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I hung the phone up. I grabbed my steering wheel as tight as I could. I said, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come upon my life to baptize me with fire and speak in a tongue. And then, poof, I felt like, literally, like a match got lit. I felt flames come all over my body. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm like, I'm like war crying. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like prophesying. It, and I'm all excited about it. Melissa's completely freaked out. She's plastered up against the window like, what in the world? Like the Taliban done got a hold of my, son, my husband, like. We get up to the hospital, we get into the operating room, the doctors, the surgeons, they take Candace's bandages off, and it's like mad chaos breaks out. They wrap her foot a little bit back up, and they tell me, we're going to need some more time to talk, and they walk out of the room. I chase them down the hallway, and I tell them, you ain't got no more time, gentlemen. You got to tell me what's going on. They said, sir, we're going to need, I said, look, you run out of time. I'm about to twist the two of you into a pretzel in about 30 seconds if you don't tell me exactly what's going on. And they said, we don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? They said for them pictures from the faxes, from, from the phone conversations, from everything we got from the military hospital, we knew we're taking leg from knee down. We were just hoping to save most of our thigh. And I said, and? And he said, we, we can find nothing wrong. I said, what do you mean you can find nothing wrong? He said, there's no swelling, there's no infection, there's no blistering, there's literally nothing wrong. And I said, is there a medical explanation for this? He said, no, it is medically impossible. It was a white dude and an Asian dude. And the Asian guy said, it's a miracle. He was a Hinduist, I would find out later, believed in many gods. And he said, some god out there in the universe decided it wasn't time for your little girl to lose her foot. I'm like, is there ever a good time for a little girl to lose her foot? But anyway, I said, so I can take her home. Well, no, where they surgically removed that main blood vesicle, that main blood blister, it's still an open wound there all the way down to the flesh. So we have to take a skin graft in the morning and take some skin from her backside and lay it over that so she doesn't get another infection. I said, no, you're not going to touch her. He said, excuse me? I said, brother, let me tell you all about that higher power. And I told them all about Jesus in the bathroom, and they thought I was a nut job. And I said, you don't got no answer, but I do. And then he came back with this awesome response. He said, well, you tell your Jesus he's got till 6.30 in the morning. Because that's what time surgery is. I was like, ooh, that's pressure. I went in, told Melissa, we wept, we prayed. Candace was knocked out. They'd already sedated her for surgery, so she was like out. High on Demerol. Five-year-old kid on Demerol, some funny stuff. She thought she was flying. Like, she's seen unicorns, butterflies, Kool-Aid man, the whole deal. And I'm, I'm praying, I'm, I'm looking back at the bathroom like, Jesus, you know, like, What's happening? What's going to happen? And about midnight, we're so exhausted. Melissa said to me, what are we going to do, Chris? I said, what can we do but trust God? Let's get some, let's get some sleep, honey. And let's just leave it to him. I woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning to the sounds of a grown man whimpering. I woke up, I looked up. And the doctor, that Asian doctor, was holding Kenneth's foot. And he was rocking back and forth, weeping like a baby. And I flew up, Doc, is everything okay? And he showed me your foot. And where there was literally no skin and raw flesh was now completely covered in skin. And he said to me, how 
do I get this Jesus into my heart? So I led him to Jesus right there while he held my daughter's foot. And then began my ministry to do what God had sent me out to do. And we went. I thought I'd be a career Marine. I loved it. I was good at it. But I knew it's time to go. I just had re-enlisted, so I had a little bit more to go. And I started studying, and then I felt called to go to Ward Harvest Bible College under Pastor Rod Parsley. And I went there, and the first day I was there, God spoke a word to me. He said, your harvest has been here waiting on you. I don't know what that meant. I'm just telling you, I was a street kid, just really learning my way through this thing. You know what I did? When I got saved, that day in the hospital, when we found out Candace was whole, a hurricane came and wiped out everything between us and our base. So we were stuck in the hospital for almost two weeks. And I went down to the library every day. They had one Bible in their entire library. An old hardback, King James. Musty smelling, yellow pages. I started to read it and I thought, what in the world is this thing saying? And I felt stupid. So I cried out to the Holy Spirit. Will you give me an understanding? Will you give me, will you give me interpretation? Will you show me what this word is? I want to know you. And I read the entire Old Testament in two weeks. And I got a hold of exactly what God wanted me to do. And so now fast forwarding, I get up the word harvest. I finish my degree. I'm going to go help my brother with his church and his rehab center. And my brother's telling me the whole time, you're not supposed to come. That word you got about your harvest being there waiting on you means you're going to be the next youth pastor of Ward Harvest Church. I'm like, bro, how in the world do you connect that dot all the way to that dot over there? I don't have a resume. I have no experience. It's the largest church in America at the time. Like, I, there's no way that's happening. Three days before I was leaving, Pastor Parsley walked up to me and said, I heard you're leaving. I said, I am. He said, that's a shame because God spoke to me a year ago when you first got here, the first day you were here, that you're going to be my next youth pastor. I was like, what? And then God just began, I'll just give you this, not for my sake, but for the sake of God's word coming true in my life already so far. The first 10 years of my ministry, I was a youth pastor. At World Harvest, and I went back to Youngstown, Ohio, where I'm from, and we built a youth center there. Then I went on to St. Louis and built another youth center there. In 10 years, we led 28,000 young people to Jesus. In 10 years. Our largest gathering was 12,000 in one gathering, where 10,800 gave their hearts to Jesus. I'm sorry, that's not, let me, let me back up. I'm giving you bad numbers. The 28,000 was in Youngstown, Ohio alone. I'm sorry. 28,000 was Youngstown, Ohio. It was 48,000 total in the 10 years. Almost 50,000 people led to Jesus in 10 years. Just in, in those three cities. And then he calls me to Plant Reach Church in Austin, Texas. I'd never been, but I'm glad I came. I love Texas. I feel like I finally found home. I moved 55 times getting here to Texas. I moved 38 times as a kid. I never had a real home. I got to Texas. They like motorcycles, guns, hunting, barbecue. You know, there's not so many skinny jeans running around. If you wear skinny jeans, it's okay, kind of. You can't fit in my truck. You got to climb into that sucker. You'd be like <laughs> ripping out your rear end. And since, in the first seven years that we planted Reach Church, we've now won over 10,000 people to Jesus in Austin, Texas, and in Killeen, Texas. I'm going to wrap up with a bit of this word, and I want to I just share this with you and, and show you what God is doing. All of those things sound amazing, but they're, they're coming at a very high cost. The love of my life, my high school sweetheart, the girl that I think about a thousand times a day. As soon as I said yes to coming to Texas, she was stricken 
with some very, very serious autoimmune diseases. There's been times where she can't get out of the bed for three weeks out of the month. We're fighting in faith. We're believing for a complete divine miracle. I've seen God heal. I know God heals. We know he will. We know it's already happened. We're just waiting for it to manifest in the natural. It's already taken place in the supernatural. Right? But still, about six months ago, I'm in a funk. All this great stuff happening. We're, we just bought 31 acres in Austin. We're building a 1,000-seat a sanctuary there. We got a campus in Killeen, and, and we've got all this. God's just doing stuff after more stuff after more stuff. He's increasing our, our ability to reach. Everything's going great on the outside. But on the inside, for the first time in my life, since that time as a teenager with that gun, I started to feel bad for myself. Why is it always going to happen to me? Why is this stuff got to be coming on me? Why is my wife got to be sick? My daughter was bit by a snake, later attacked by a pit bull. Then, you know, my, my I, I, mean, I just name you, attack after attack after attack that the devil has done upon my family for us pursuing the perfect will of God for our life. It shouldn't be a shock. It shouldn't be a surprise. This is what he does. This is, this is who he is. He's the thief. He's the destroyer. He's the murderer. The thief has come but yet to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give life. Life overflowing. Abundant life. That sounds amazing. But for some reason... On the inside of my heart and my head, it's cloudy. I'm wondering, do I have what it takes to move on? Is this going to be the rest of my, all these thoughts, all these over, has anybody ever been there with me where, where all of a sudden you feel like you can't explain it, but you start to look, you lost your business, your partner turned their back on you, you, you had a loved one die, you your wife or your husband ran around on you or ran out on you or you got sickness in your family or your finances are under so much pressure you're not sure you're going to be able to make it through. You got all this stuff. You got a heart attack. You got a, you had a stroke. You all this stuff going on. And we're always looking. And the next thing you know, here's what the devil does an amazing job at is he gets us to focus on woe is me. And I was woeing, man. I was woeing with the best of them. And then God spoke, and everything changed in an instant. See, here's who Satan is. In heaven, before he was cast out, he was a cherub. The Bible shows us that a cherub is not no cute little fat boy with wings with a, a bow flying around. A cherub was a monstrous being. A cherub was the guardian of the glory of God in heaven. One day, Satan decided, I want that glory for myself. We see in scripture that it says he wanted his throne to ascend higher than the throne of God. So he gathered together one third of all the angels, all the angelic beings, seraphim, cherubs, warring angels, generals, messaging angels, gathered together one third of them and he came at God, but the Bible says they were cast out of heaven like a flash of lightning. It was faster than a Mike Tyson, Leon Spinks knockout. It wasn't even a fight. God was like, what? He was like Thanos, right? If you haven't watched the movie, I don't want to spoil it. He was greater than Thanos. But hear this now. Where does Satan live now? Ephesians 6 and a lot of other scriptures show us that his domain is the heavenlies around us, the atmosphere. He doesn't live in some burning pit. He lives in the atmosphere. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So you thought your neighbor had a problem with you. Your neighbor don't got a problem with you. I'm going to tell you who he's got a problem with in a minute. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness set in high places. Then I love the word. Having done everything you know how to do to stand, keep standing. Abide in him. 
is what the Greek translation bears out to be. Stand, not on your own, but stand in him. So Satan, guardian of glory, try to get God's glory, thrown out of heaven, down here on earth. Then the glory of God got put in a box called the Ark of the Covenant. Before Jesus came, that box was the only place that you could find the very glory of God. Nobody could enter into the Holy of Member, the outer courts, the inner courts, the, the bread table, the Holy of Holies. And nobody could go into the Holy of Holies except for the high priest. And even when the high priest would go in, you know what he had to wear? He had to wear a robe with bells all around the bottom of it, with an ankle strap, a rope strapped around his ankle. Because if he had sin in his heart, he would walk in there in the glory and he would drop dead. They would hear the bells ring and they would drag his butt out and they would look at the next one and be like, next. And the dudes would be like, uh uh-uh, man, I need time. I ain't going in right now. But when Jesus took his last breath on the cross, and the great earthquake struck the temple. It says that the veil was torn in two. I would hear preachers preaching that all the time, and the veil was torn in two. And I'd be like, why was the veil torn in two? And then I got it one day. It was torn in two because the glory of God was no longer meant to live in a box, but the glory of God was meant to live on the inside of me. And if the glory of God lives in me, what was Satan after from the beginning? He was after the glory. I got somewhere I'm going with this. I, I, I'm wrapping it up right now, but I, I got I to gotta show this to you. Acts chapter 9, it says, Now Saul, murderer of Christians, Saul, imprisoner of Christians, Saul, the most feared man of the church on the planet, still breathing threats and murder with every breath against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest. And he asked for letters from him to go to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men, women, and children, he might bring them back bound in chains to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly, somebody say suddenly, your life could change suddenly in a moment. Suddenly, this is so good, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I woke up one morning six months ago, and the Holy Spirit spoke this scripture to me. I went to my Bible, and I started studying immediately. I felt like an answer was coming for the funk that I was in. And when I went and I read this, something came alive to me. I've read this hundreds of times. Something came alive that I've never seen because the Holy Spirit can show us the living Word of God right when we need it. And I got into this thing, and I... I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The church is literally living in fear of Saul. And Saul, it says right here, was going to Damascus to arrest the disciples of Jesus, bring them back, men, women, and children, in chains to Jerusalem. Yes? So Saul's target is the believers. Saul is the arrow of the enemy. And the devil... He's honing in like an Olympic archer on that bullseye of Damascus. But not really. Because look what Jesus says to Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my believers? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my followers? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the ones that follow the way? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He didn't say, why, are you hearing me? He didn't say any of that. He said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Saul did, who are you, Lord? And he said back to him, 
I am Jesus. Hear this though, the one. I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. I've got a word for you today. You are not the target. You've never been the target. Hear this and hear this clearly. It's never been about you. They ran out on you. It wasn't about you. They betrayed you. It wasn't about you. They cheated on you. It wasn't about you. They stole from you. It wasn't about you. It was never personal. You took it personally. You got offended. You hold unforgiveness. You hold anger. But here's the key. The devil's so good at what he does because Jesus said, if you cannot forgive, you will not be forgiven. So the devil's truth to all of this is to get you into a position where you're filled with hurt, where you're filled with pain, where you're filled with anger, where you despise even hearing or seeing the face of somebody who hurts you. Why? Because you took it personal. Baby, listen to me. It was never personal. It was just business. The devil is about the business. Hear this now. He was never coming at you for you. He was coming at you for the one who lives on the inside of you. He's always been after the glory of God. What does the Bible say the glory of God is? It is His Son, His one and only begotten Son. And He is living vibrantly on the inside of you. And so He, the devil, has been pursuing you, bringing others tools of evil, tools of wickedness, trying to get you to give up that glory. Because He wants it. It's all he's ever wanted. Could you imagine if you were Satan? Don't imagine too much on that. But if you can imagine if, if you were in Satan's shoes and the very one thing you were created to guard, you ended up coveting, then you went after, then you got your tail kicked, and now you're living on earth, and then all of a sudden, thousands of years later, God just gives it freely to a bunch of imperfect mess-ups like us. And he's feeling like, yo, man, I'm like 15 feet tall. I could crush them. With a snap of my finger. I'm, I'm, I'm beautiful. I, I, was, I was your man. I, was, I, was, I guarded your glory. And you're just going to give it to them. This is why Satan hates your guts. This is why he's come. Listen, to steal. What is he trying to steal? The glory. To kill. What is he trying to kill? Your dreams, your purpose, and to destroy. The word destroy means to take the breath out. So it's always been never about you. You've never been the target. Can I, can I, I'm going to close with this. Just a, I, I, I got to do it in my ghetto way, okay? Is that okay? Uh, imagine if you were going to rob an armored truck. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. That's wrong. But if you do, please tithe to Harvest Time Revival Center, right? Maybe give an offering off of it. But if you were going to, you watch the movies. You've seen enough of it to know kind of how it works. What's the first thing that they do? They, they set up a detour to, just, to, get the, to get the truck off of its normal route. And then they'll, they'll lay out spike strips, pop the tires. Then they bring in like a bigger truck, like a dump truck or a, or, or a garbage truck, and they ram and blindside it, and they pin it in somewhere. Then they put C4 on the doors, and they blow its doors off. And then they take the torch and they cut a hole in that cage all along to get after the loot that's on the inside. Hear me and hear me clearly. Some of you have been detoured. Some of you, some of you have been blindsided. Some of you feel like you've had the air sucked out of you. Some of you feel like somebody else has blowed your doors off. Someone in here feels like someone's just cut a gaping hole on the inside of you. Baby, listen to me and listen to me clearly. It was never about you. It was about the loot. It was about the glory. It was about what is on the in side of you. Now you don't have to take it personally. Now you can understand it's just business. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be about the Father's business. The devil has his business. God's is bigger. God's is greater. God's is stronger. But when we allow the enemy to give us 
unforgiveness. We allow the enemy to, to trick our mind and, and get us to hold, hold hard feelings or ill thoughts towards somebody else. All we are doing is giving him fuel. Jesus said it and said it clearly. He said, to Peter said, how many times should I forgive? And he said, 70 times 7. That's not literally 490 times that you're supposed to forgive. And then on the 491, you could just forget about it. What it means is like today, it's a, it's a word expression. It's like today somebody says a zillion. Well, really a zillion is impossible for any of us. But, and we probably don't get offended a zillion times. If you do, man, you need to toughen up. But hear this and hear this clearly. Jesus is saying is you never stop forgiving. When I think about what he's done for me, I think about what he's forgiven me of. I think about what he's taken from me. Oh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I lay my life down to him as a living and holy sacrifice. I want it to be pleasing, Lord. I don't want to be conformed to this world's way of thinking. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I may be used for your good, acceptable, and perfect will. Can we bow our head and close our eyes? I have two questions for you today. And the first one is this. Do you know that you know that you know in the depths of your heart that you belong to him, to Jesus? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you have been forgiven of every sin, every mistake that you have ever made. He is so amazing. He said, if you would just ask me to forgive you, I will be faithful and I will be just to forgive you of each and every single sin. I will take them from you. I will cast them as far as the east is from the west. I will plunge them in the depths of the sea and remember them no more. What an amazing God. He not only forgives, but he completely forgets everything that you've ever done. Wipes out your past. Gives you a fresh start. A new beginning. A clean slate. Some of you today, you need to, you need to make that commitment. You've been running for too long. God's been knocking at your door. Jesus said in Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart. And I knock, and if you'll just let me in, I will come into you. I will live in you. I will be friends with you. And some of you here today, you've, you've prayed a prayer like this before, but you know in your heart that your life is not reflecting the decision you once made. I'm not asking you to commit to a religion. I'm not asking you to commit. God, Jesus was never about religion. He was about relationships. I'm asking you today to commit to a relationship, to begin to walk out that relationship with your creator, with your maker, with your savior. If you're here and you want to say yes, or you want to recommit a yes you once made, without fear, without worry, without delay, I'm going to ask you on the count of three, shoot your hand up nice and high right there where you're at. Here we go. One, two, hands are already going up. Three, let me see them nice and high. Come on. Nice and high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I see all those hands. Thank you, guys. Thank you. For each and every one of you that raised that hand, we're going to pray a prayer in just a minute, but I, I, I want to I ask one more question. How many of you today feel like you're having a hard time. Don't feel bad. This is not to bring guilt or shame on you. This is to bring freedom to you. How many of you feel like today, you know what? I've been struggling with a little bit of woe is me. I've been struggling, feeling like, you know what? I, I, I'm having a hard time getting past what somebody else did to me. I'm having a hard time even getting past maybe something I did to myself. I'm, I, I'm struggling to forgive somebody. I'm struggling to, to let go and let God. I, I, I've been working at it, but I, I don't feel like I got it. But today, I got it. I see it. It's a plan to keep me off of my track, my path with God. How many of you today would say, that's me? Put your hand up nice and high in the air real quick. Come on, hands up all over. Hands up all over. So many hands, too many to count. Everybody in the room, let's stand to our feet. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you said yes, that you want to surrender your heart to Jesus, or you said, you know what? I'm dealing with something. I'm dealing with something, some weight, some guilt, some shame, some pain that I need to get rid of. Then I'm going to ask you right now.